Okay, guys, thanks for putting up with this somewhat disjointed lecture. Um, appreciate your guys' patience and willingness to be such a good audience to George. I know he enjoys talking about what he does, and hopefully you guys learned a decent amount about HIV and hepatitis C. Um, I'm going to just pick up where I left off. There's only a couple slides left in this lecture, so we'll get through it pretty quick. I want to talk really quick about sepsis and bacteremia. Um, the reason why I lump them together is usually a bloodstream infection is a sign of sepsis. It's not necessarily always the case. You can have a bloodstream infection and not be septic. Um, and normally patients who are septic are going to have positive blood cultures in a lot of cases. But you can also have a local source like a, a large infection in the lungs or large cellulitis that causes enough of a systemic inflammatory response that you're going to end up with sepsis. Uh, we're going to talk about sepsis and shock a little bit more when we talk about emergency medicine and critical care next summer. Uh, so we'll go into a little bit more detail, but basically sepsis is an uh, infection that's causing a systemic inflammatory response. So what happens is the um, body releases a lot of inflammatory mediators, which cause vasodilation, which drops blood pressure. Um, the heart tries to compensate the, for this by increasing its rate. So a typical sepsis patient is going to have standard um, infectious markers. So um, high temperature, white cells, uh, elevated. And then they're going to have some hemodynamic changes. So they're going to be usually hypotensive and tachycardic. And those are some of the hallmarks. There's also a lab that we can measure called lactate, which hopefully we've talked about in other classes. But um, that's another thing that's a sign of inflammation. And it's a sign that if it's really high, that's a good chance that patients are um, septic. There's a lot of other things that can raise lactate too, but when you combine it with the clinical picture, and then for sepsis to be an actual thing, you have to have some sort of a known infectious source. When a patient comes in septic, uh, you're going to treat them very quickly and you're going to treat them broad spectrum. There's no real time to figure out what you're going to narrow it down in most cases. And evidence shows the faster you start antibiotics, the higher, uh, excuse me, the lower the mortality rate overall. So even delays of antibiotics by um, 30 minutes or an hour can be enough to possibly increase mortality. So when it comes to treating sepsis, um, broad spectrum is the name of the game. So looking at vancomycin for every sepsis patient, they're going to get vanco to make sure you're covering possible MRSA. And then you're also going to use probably one of these three drugs, so zosin, acarbapenem, or cefepime. That's your backbone. Um, if you choose cefepime, you have to remember that cefepime does not cover anaerobes, whereas zosin and carbapenem, um, carbapenems do. So if you had somebody uh, who's septic and you're suspecting maybe a GI source or an intra-abdominal source, you would need to add metronidazole on to that as well. Um, the other thing to think about, too, is if your pulmonary source is, a, is an issue or a suspected issue, you might want to add azithromycin on to cover atypicals because none of these options cover atypicals. So those would be kind of the sepsis caveats there. So GI, metronidazole, pulmonary, um, uh, azithromycin, azithromycin, excuse me. And so with, with that in mind, you can tailor your therapy. So, yeah, if somebody was given, like at our hospital, we use cefepime as our primary workout course for our gram negative coverage. So somebody came in and it was suspected um, uh, not only pulmonary infection, but uh, sepsis with a possible pulmonary source, possible GI source. And believe me, when you have a septic patient, sometimes they do look like this where you, you don't necessarily have a, a, a good idea of where the infection is coming from. They could end up on four antibiotics. You could end up with vanco, cefepime, metronidazole, and um, azithromycin to make sure everything's covered. kind of sounds like overkill, and it might be in a lot of cases, but again, a lot of these aren't going to continue for the whole course. Hopefully, you're going to figure out what the actual source is, narrow it down, get infectious disease involved, but you want to start broad and make sure the patient's getting antibiotics. And of course, they have to get blood cultures beforehand just to make sure that we can hopefully isolate uh, an organism if one is uh, uh, causing the problem. Um, this next slide just shows sepsis as far as SIRS criteria. SIRS is Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And SIRS is basically all the things I mentioned as far as having some infectious parameters, hemodynamic changes, without the infectious component of it. So there's no known infection. It's simply just inflammation. Um, and then with sepsis, you have two SIRS plus confirmed infection. And then when you move to shock, you're getting really persistent hypotension that's not responding 
to, um, it might not be responding to fluids, might not re be responding to vasopressors, and you also have an elevated lactate as well. Uh, to round out this lecture, I want to talk about a couple of random other things. Tuberculosis in and of itself is quite a complicated disease to treat. Um, I'm not going to require you know anything about tuberculosis because I don't think it's all that beneficial. Um, so you can ignore this for test purposes, but tuberculosis is uh, usually there's a kind of a four standard regimen, drug regimen, and they're all weird drugs. Notice we haven't talked about any of these with the exception of rifampin, which we barely talked about in endocarditis. Um, but isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Um, tuberculosis is a big deal on the international on an international scale. So when you have to look at the drugs, a lot of these drugs are, are chosen because they might be inexpensive. You can use them in areas with maybe um, lower resources than we might have here in the United States. But tuberculosis is a long uh, treatment course. Usually you're looking at taking all four agents for two months and then just the isoniazid and uh, rifampin alone for another four. And then there's some other options too. There are other things that are um, effective. Fluoroquinolones work. However, they have high rates of resistance, so we try not to use them. Uh, there's some unusual drugs that might be used in resistant cases too, but this is kind of the backbone of the regimen. Uh, if you ever work in um, international medicine or um, with patient populations that have tuberculosis, you'll get very familiar with it. Otherwise, you're probably never going to see it. Lyme, however, is pretty common, especially in Minnesota and in the upper Midwest in general. Lyme is a tick-borne illness. It's uh, a bacteria, or it's caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, it's a spirochete, which is actually similar to syphilis as far as its um, uh, the the cell type, and then also um, how it uh, how it affects the body too. It has these stages of infection, kind of very similar to what we talked about with syphilis. Doxycycline is the drug of choice. It's 100 milligrams PO BID for 10 to 21 days. So usually you go with a two or three week course for most patients if they present with symptoms of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. um, with Lyme, uh, I guess I'll go back to this slide quick. So basic uh, Lyme disease, early disease, is going to be erythema migrans, which is this target-like rash that's kind of the hallmark. So that's where the deer tick will bite somebody. Um, and cause that uh, rash if there is indeed early Lyme. So that's the hallmark. Um, oftentimes you could get a tick bite, possibly not notice it at all. Um, there could be Lyme disease still, even if there isn't erythema migraines. So it just really depends on um, the presentation. But this is the kind of the classic textbook, um, erythema migraines of, of uh, a Borrelia burgdorferi infection. If Lyme isn't treated initially, um, you can end up with a couple complications that, again, is going to sound kind of like syphilis, neurologic, um, cardiovascular, and arthritis uh, components. So um, the problem with spirochetes and with syphilis, too, is that the longer you let them go untreated, the more they get into different areas and kind of burrow into places and cause lots of damage. So you can end up with cardiotoxicity and cardiac cell problems that can cause um, different uh, arrhythmias. You end up with neurologic problems that are... Uh, cause um, specifically some nerve palsies. You can end up with a meningitis-like symptoms, encephalitis. Um, and arthritis can, can be uh, apparent too, so joint pain. Um, generally, this is treated the same way. So if somebody has advanced Lyme disease and they test positive for the bacteria, you would still treat them with doxycycline. Um, ceftriaxone also has pretty good coverage of Lyme disease, so that's uh, another option we can consider. Um, there's some other tick-borne illnesses. Ehrlichiosis is one of them that we uh, do a test for. And the other one is anaplasmosis. Um, the reason is is because they present very similarly. They're treated virtually the same way um, with maybe a little bit different of courses. And um, it's something that if somebody doesn't test positive for Lyme, uh, they might have the same symptoms, and they might actually have ehrlichiosis or um, anaplasmosis. And uh, so when, when somebody does a, is suspecting Lyme disease, there's a panel that they'll usually do of testing, and it includes these other uh, choices as well. Uh, the only other thing I'll say about Lyme is that, um, I, you know, you, hear, you may or may not have heard the news, like the concept of chronic Lyme disease. 
And um, the problem with Lyme is that if it goes untreated for a while, it can cause um, long-lasting neurologic deficit, long-lasting arthritis-type symptoms. Um, however, uh, this can linger beyond the bacteria's lifespan. So if you um, eradicate the bacteria, you can still have some of the symptoms. So there is some controversy. Occasionally, I see people come in to the hospital and they're on these treatments, these intense antibiotic courses for chronic Lyme. There's no actual evidence that's effective. In fact, it probably puts them at risk for A, resistant infections, B, C, difficile, C, side effects from being on really prolonged antibiotic courses. And also, it's, it's just not proven. Uh, most infectious disease experts would disagree that you treat a chronic Lyme, quote unquote. However, there is a general consensus that Lyme does have long lasting effects, just likely not due to the presence of a bacteria. We can eradicate the bacteria fairly well with our doxy or ceftriaxone. Um, beyond that, if there's already some damage to neurologic tissue or the heart or the joints, that is something that the body will need to heal over time. And sometimes that can be a difficult and long process. So, so I'll say we'll move on to um, the rest of the antivirals here next. Okay, so just to finish up on George's slides and a little known fact, uh, these are actually mostly my slides that I gave George. <laughs> so um, I did this lecture the first year I did it, and then I had him come in just because he knows so much more about HIV, and he obviously completely rearranged the HIV stuff, but um, these are originally mine, so don't, don't think I'm totally copying him, but if you want to think that, that's fine too. Uh, herpes is something I want to touch really briefly on uh, as far as the different types, and I really just want to focus on a couple of them. So there's multiple different types of herpes. You've probably heard of a lot of these things. Um, there's HSV type 1 and 2, which are the really common cold sores. Uh, type 1 is typically considered to be the above the waist. Type 2 is typically considered to be below the waist. However, both type 1 and type 2 can go either way. So um, there's really no discrimination there. Uh, but it is kind of the historical difference between the two. They present almost identically. There's really no difference. They're treated the same way. Uh, HSV is uh, varicella zoster. So this is going to be the virus that causes chickenpox or shingles. Um, uh, type 4 is Epstein-Barr, which is also known as mono. I'm sure everyone's heard of that. Um, type 5 is called cryptomegalovirus. This is something that really, or CMV, or cytomegalovirus, excuse me, not crypto. Um, this is something that people... Um, really don't see unless they have uh, pretty immunocompromised states. So maybe like a person with advanced HIV, potentially uncontrolled HIV. Um, HSV types um, six and seven, roseola is something that's seen in children. Actually, my son got this a little while ago. It's pretty benign. There's no real treatment for it. They might have a mild fever, but that's about it. Uh, it goes away in a couple of days. Um, you get this kind of profuse rash all over the body though. Um, HSV type Seven is something associated with Carposi sarcoma, which is another HIV uh, specific one for the most part. And it's something that is, again, immunocompromised. It causes these kind of large um, uh, purplish um, looking lesions. All right, let's see. So anti-HSV drugs, there's really only a couple I want you to know. And the primary options where I want you to focus. The rest of the stuff I will not test you on. It's there for, for a reason um, because it might be used in more severe cases, but we really don't care. Like, for example, Viderabine is an ophthalmic one. So somebody had HSV in their eye, you could use that. Docosinol is the over-the-counter product of Breva. Um, and again, I'm not going to test you on that, but if you've ever seen that, that's an anti uh, herpes virus drug, and I'll, I'll talk about it very briefly here, but really I want you to focus on acyclovir and valacyclovir. Um, I'm probably not going to ask anything about famcyclovir, although um, because we don't really use it as much, but it might be an option. So I'm, if I ask you about an anti-HSV drug, the odds of the correct answer being acyclovir or valacyclovir are quite good. I'll give you that little pearl here right away um, just for tuning in this evening. Uh, so anyway, anti-HSV drugs, what they do is um, ACV is abbreviated here uh, on, the, uh, on this block here, this kind of like orangish brown color, and you have um, acyclovir gets pulled into um, the HSV infected cell and it gets substituted in uh, during the replication process via this enzyme called cellular kinase, and ultimately um, it causes chain termination. So it's something that uh, is a pretty straightforward mechanism. It works like a lot of our, our other HIV drugs that we talked about. So the ones that are supplementing base pairs and some of the chemotherapy options we talked about too. 
Um, so acyclovir is the standard older drug. It's the only IV HSV agent. And when people have aseptic meningitis, it's usually HSV that's the cause. So a lot of times these patients who um, come in with meningitis-like symptoms, but maybe they have a negative gram stain, they'll be started on acyclovir. Uh, as well as usually antibiotics, just until we can for sure rule out any bacterial involvement. It gets into the CNS really well. It does have a really short half-life, usually like at three to five times a day, and that's either oral or IV. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the half-life doesn't change with different ones. So that's one of the biggest problems with this drug. If you wanted to treat somebody's HSV one or two outbreak with acyclovir, you have to give it so often that most people aren't going to take it. Um, so that's where valacyclovir comes into to play. Um, it's useful in, uh, again, aseptic meningitis, but you have also oral and genital herpes, chicken pox, uh, but again, we generally use valacyclovir. It is pregnancy category B. Valacyclovir is essentially just acyclovir. However, it's, um, it's got a lot better bioavailability. So it's a different type of ester of acyclovir and it absorbs better. So you get about a three to five times serum, uh, higher serum concentration initially from a dose of valacyclovir than you would acyclovir. And what that does is it fills up your, your tank, if you wanna think about your body as like a gas tank with more uh, volume, therefore it's gonna take longer to eliminate all that drug. Um, so you get more, um, more time uh, of efficacy. So usually it's dosed, one to three times a day and it really depends on what you're doing so like for oral genital herpes you're usually can like a bid regimen um, some people might take once daily for chronic prophylaxis if they get a lot of um, uh, oral or genital herpes outbreaks and varicella zoster uh, treatment would be a bit more aggressive where you're looking at three times a day dosing uh, valacyclovir does not come as an iv form if you think about it it doesn't really make sense why it would it's designed to be a, a high oral bioavailability product and really it's just acyclovir so yes you you have your alternative which is iv acyclovir which works just fine um, which is essentially the same drug so really acyclovir valacyclovir basically the same the only thing to remember about valacyclovir it lasts longer it's more convenient for patients to take and this is valtrex most people have probably seen ads for valtrex or heard about valtrex although it's been generic for a little while now um, these drugs, I'm just going to skip over them for the most part. I'll mention again Abriva. It's that OTC topical one. Um, and the, the way it works is it blocks off um, the ability of the virus to get into further cells. So you can shorten the healing time by about one day. It's kind of expensive. It costs a lot for a really small tube of it. Um, from what I've heard, if you can, a lot of people who get cold sores, I don't get them, so I don't really know. But people who do will say that they, they can feel one coming on. And uh, if you do feel that, you could uh, possibly apply this to the area early and maybe prevent it. Um, it tends to work better if you apply it on the front end of things than if you start once the cold sore has already um, appeared. All right, so George covered a lot of this. I'll just touch base really quick on Hep A and B. Um, Hep A is a uh, RNA virus, and it's a pretty self-limiting illness. It's associated a lot with um, a water quality issues in developing countries. So a lot of people who travel will get Hep A as a vaccine. There is a vaccine for Hep A, so we, we don't generally have to worry about it for most people. However, of course, in areas with poor access to healthcare, you could see outbreaks of this happen. Um, usually you're looking at um, what I would think of as standard viral infection. So flu-like symptoms, headache, plus you get these GI symptoms, which is maybe a little bit unusual for the average virus. More like a, um, almost more like a, uh, you know, what we'd call stomach bug or like a rotavirus or something like that type of a symptom. But it's usually, again, uh, fairly self-limiting, although the symptoms can last up to two months. So it can be a bit longer than what you'd think of as like your standard stomach bug that somebody might get where they feel really ill and nauseous for a day or two and then it goes away. This might last quite a bit longer. Um, so vaccination is, is the key here. And um, avoiding contaminated water sources by... Um, Washing your hands and watching the food you get, you eat when you're abroad can make a big difference in preventing um, the acquiring of hepatitis A. Um, Hep B is a 2 billion person worldwide infected illness. This is another um, disease that we have a vaccine for. So if you're paying attention, Hep A and B have vaccines. Hep C does not. Uh, so that's one of the big differences that we um, between the viruses is these are more easily targeted with vaccines, whereas Hep C we can't. However, Hep C we have the drugs like George talked about that actually can cure it. So that's kind of the, that's another big difference between the two too. With hepatitis B, 
um, if you get it, there's no cure per se. Um, the treatments are extremely complicated. I'm not going to ask any questions about hepatitis B treatment because it's not really worth it. I think they're just um, they're they're way they're all over the place. There's no really good drug that works all that well. Um, there's a couple of drugs like lamivudine that's a um, uh, anti-HIV med that they use sometimes, and there's a couple other ones that are um, shown. There's also a product called interferon. Interferon, uh, like hepatitis B interferon, can be used sometimes. Interferon products are really just um, uh, synthetic versions of natural substances that um, immune cells make when they um, want to fight off infections. It's kind of a way of the, augmenting the body's natural response. Interferons are used in uh, hepatitis B. They were used in hepatitis C for a long time until we got the new drugs out. Um, and then there's a lot of cancers they're used into and some other indications. Uh, they can be fairly toxic for the most part. People don't usually do too well or tolerate them very well but they are an option for hep B. All right, um, George covered hepatitis C. I'm not gonna reiterate any of this. Um, let's move on to influenza uh, quickly. So influenza is a disease that affects about uh, 20 to 50 million individuals. Um, it's, and that's an annual infection. Of course, influenza kind of migrates and changes with the flu season every year, and there's different strains that are targeted each year that show up each year. Um, so there's a lot of epidemiology involvement as far as predicting what type of strain we're going to be looking at and making sure we're getting vaccinated against that specific strain. Patients at highest risk are those over age 65 and those less than two. Um, there's three major subtype, subtypes. So you have influenza A and B, and then you have these um, H and N abbreviations, which are for different surface proteins. And that's what differentiates the, the strains from each one. So you have like H1N1 or um, H3N4, stuff like that. Um, antigenic drift uh, is what's responsible for the virus changing year to year and requiring our updates to the vaccine. Um, you may have similar ones that affect each year, but there's still a lot of, again, epidemiology studies that go in to figure out what exactly we're going to be at highest risk for. There's a lot of strains out there. It can be very difficult to predict it sometimes. Sometimes we're, our vaccine is dead on. We're really effective. Sometimes we're 50%. And those are, of course, unf unfortunate years. Um, antigenic shift is a term you might hear about flu, too. And what that is is these changes that usually result in the surface proteins, and these end up causing a slightly higher virulence. So, for example, like avian influenza or the um, 1918 Spanish flu, those are examples of really um, problematic influenza outbreaks. Uh, influenza is a respiratory illness, so one of my biggest pet peeves in the general public is when people say, oh, I have the flu, and they're complaining because they got, you know, GI symptoms and diarrhea and vomiting. That's not influenza. Um, you may have some GI symptoms, but it's actually quite unusual for influenza to present with GI symptoms. It's not one of the more common presentations. It's possible, generally not something we think of. It's a respiratory illness. Um, coupled with the general viral type sy syndrome. So you have headache, fever, muscle pain, um, and then you'll have the respiratory non-productive cough, sore throat. It's usually fairly quick onset. And then again, you have the, like I mentioned with um, pneumonia treatment and streptococcal pneumonia, that's one of the um, big killers of people where people will end up with a pneumonia. And um, George put in a slide here, classically it's MRSA pneumonia. That's definitely a possibility too. And that could of course be quite difficult to treat as well. Um, so you, you get this co-infection and that's what ends up um, putting people in the ICU. And you hear about the young, like young people who die of influenza. It's not because they got the virus, it's because they usually got um, some sort of a comorbid pneumonia on board as well. Um, the vaccine is, of course, the best way to prevent, even if it's not uh, super effective some years. It's still a 50% reduction in flu catching is a lot better than everyone getting it. Um, we um, actually mandate vaccination in the hospital. Well, not mandate it. It's pretty close to that. Um, you have to sign something saying you either got it at the hospital and you have to wear this little thing on your badge showing you got it, or you have to sign something saying you got it outside the hospital. Um, ideally, everyone gets vaccinated right now, so starting now to about October. Um, kids uh, get two vaccines uh, between two months and eight years, uh, four weeks apart. 
Um, everyone else just gets one vaccine, and pretty much anyone can get uh, vaccinated to the flu shot. There's really very few contraindications to flu vaccine. Um, some people think like pregnancy is a contraindication. It's not. Uh, the flu vaccine is not live. The um, the nasal um, vaccine, flu mist, is a live attenuated virus, so that wouldn't be something we would give to pregnant people or immunocompromised people. Uh, but that actually, I think, for the most part, is probably not going to be used anymore. There's some recent data. This is the first year where they, the CDC has come out with a recommendation to avoid using it altogether, and that's in combination with IDSA and some other um, bodies that studied this and just found that it's really almost not as it's just not as effective as our IM injections. So, um, sorry, people, you got to get the shot. Uh, don't don't get the live one. Uh, it's not going to help as much. Um, there is an egg-free product, so egg allergies and anaphylaxis is probably the only major contraindication to the flu vaccine. And if you get that, uh, flu block is a specific product that's an egg-free flu vaccine. Um, the CDC is a great source for this, and it should um, have all the information you could ever want to know about the flu vaccine. Um, neuraminase inhibitors are drugs we can use to treat influenza once it starts. Uh, so Tamiflu or also Tamivir, probably the one people have heard of and the most common drug. Uh, it's an oral capsule. It also comes as a suspension. And um, early administration is really crucial. After 48 hours, there's really no point in giving somebody Tamiflu. Um, if you have somebody who's really, really ill, uh, you could try it. It might help. But um, for the most part, you want to start it right when the symptoms uh, uh, begin. Uh, studies show that you decrease duration of influenza by about one day, which can be pretty significant if you think about it. If somebody can get back to work a day earlier um, or if they just aren't feeling like crap for another day, that's a pretty big deal for somebody. I know I would take the drug and, and hope for that one day. That'd be fine. Uh, but it's not like a monumental. It's not like it just stops flu in its tracks. Um, you do have to kind of wait it out still. Um, Tamiflu is approved in ages one or older, uh, but the American Academy of Pediatrics has some unlabeled dosing recommendations for zero to 11 months. So really it's used in kids of all ages. The other product is uh, called Zanamivir or Relenza, which is an inhaled product. It's 10 milligrams twice a day for five days. Um, it has some contraindications for people who are asthmatic or COPD. It can tend to exacerbate their illness, um, and it's only indicated in child, children age 7 and older. So for the young kids, we wouldn't use Zanamivir. Relenza is not really used very frequently. Tamiflu is almost exclusively used for most people. Um, amantadines, or aman <laughs> sorry, adamantanes, which is amantadine or rimantadine, are um, two drugs that uh, could possibly be used. They aren't used very often anymore. I mean, the, the neuraminidase inhibitors are, are definitely the big ones, specifically Tamiflu. Um, these drugs, they're they're older and cheaper, so where they might be seen used sometimes is like for um, if there's an outbreak of influenza in a nursing home, they might use these just and treat people prophylactically. Um, <clears throat> the H1N1 and some other variants are resistant, so there are certain types that it's not good for, but if, if the outbreak is a specific subset that's affected by um, amantadine, you could try it. But we really don't um, use them all that much anymore. It's pretty unusual. HPV, uh, there won't be any test questions on this. Um, the Gardasil vaccine is the one that, and there's another one out, I think, that even covers more strains now, probably. Um, but it's a STD that causes genital perianal warts. It actually causes any type of common skin wart. There's like 100 strains of it. Um, the type 6, 11, 16, and 18 are the ones responsible for um, uh, either genital warts or um, the warts types that cause cervical, penile, or also oral throat cancer. So the Gardasil vaccine is targeted at those four subtypes. Um, there's a topical drug that works too, but again, I'm not, I'm not going to ask test questions on HPV, so don't worry about that. Uh, vaccines, I'll go into vaccine detail more during pediatrics. Uh, we'll talk about the schedules and stuff. Um, basically, the rule of thumb is vaccines are good. We like them. They don't cause autism, so uh, we'll get into that a lot more um, when, I, when I do the PEDS lecture, and we'll talk about some of those controversies for you. But until then, that's it uh, as far as antivirals go. Uh, I'm going to spend about 20 minutes, hopefully less than that, doing antifungals here uh, for the third 
part part of this, and I'll I'll focus on what you really need to know for antifungals. It's a it's a few slides, like thirty slides, but I think um, there's only a couple things I really want you to get out of it. But I'm going to cover it just for completion's sake. All right, so this is kind of a hodgepodge of things, but before we get into this, let's do a couple of review cases for antibiotics. Um, we have AM, a 52-year-old man with past medical history, hypertension, diabetes, MI, three years ago, um, presented to urgent care, productive cough, fever, malaise, has a chest x-ray, indicates left lower lobe pneumonia, um, healthy enough to be discharged. However, you'd like to give him one dose of a medication IV now and something to take at home. All right, so which one of these choices is most appropriate? I'll give you a second to think if you want to pause and think about it for a minute, and then I'll go through the answer. So uh, let's go through each choice. So A is levofloxacin IV one dose, levofloxacin PO. That seems like a pretty reasonable choice. Levaquin, if you remember, levofloxacin is one of our uh, good options for pneumonia, community-acquired pneumonia. It works well. This guy does have some past medical history, so he would be put into uh, maybe the comorbid group as far as community acquired pneumonia treatment. Um, ceftriaxone IV times one dose plus azithromycin PO. This might sound okay. Problem is, is if you give somebody a dose of ceftriaxone, whoops, sorry, I do not want to start my computer now. Let's see. Uh, ceftriaxone one dose now is great, but you you can't just give somebody that and then continue them on azithromycin. You have to continue the um, strep pneumo coverage throughout the whole course in addition to the atypical coverage. So this you'd be covering strep pneumo right away and atypicals right away, but you'd only be covering atypicals for the remainder of the course. So that's not what we want. Um, doxycycline. In this guy, because of his comorbidities, I would probably go with Leviquin. It might just be a little bit more of a sure bet, bit better strep pneumo coverage overall. Um, so doxy would be okay if this person didn't really have any history, but for this case, probably not. Um, and then D, Zosin uh, plus Augmentin just doesn't really make any sense. Um, I tried, <laughs> it's kind of like a tricky one. You might think, well, Zosin's a bigger version of Augmentin, but um, you're missing atypicals for one thing, and we just generally don't really use these drugs for community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, we can buy with something more uh, less broad spectrum than that. So uh, the correct answer is A, Levaquin plus Levaquin. Case two, we got a 74-year-old woman who is obese, has diabetes, significant complications, uh, amput amputation of her left great toe two years ago. Diabetes is poorly controlled, and today she has been admitted to your inpatient unit due to fevers, new deep necrotic ulcer on the sole of her right foot. Uh, you don't have any recent culture data. What antibiotic strategy is best to start? So empiric st strategy for diabetic foot ulcer. And I'll, again, I'll give you a second to pause and think about it. Um, so you can go a number of different directions with this, and there's a number of combinations that could work, but of course I'll only give you one that makes the most sense. Um, and really what we're looking for here is broad spectrum coverage. And when it comes to a diabetic foot ulcer, the thing to remember is polymicrobial infection. Um, so with this in mind, we not only want to cover gram negatives, but we want to cover our gram positives and we want to cover potentially resistant pathogens. Um, and we also want to cover anaerobes because of that, those deep, these deep ulcerations can have anaerobic involvement. So usually that's going to rule out a drug like cefepime. So choice D, vanco and cefepime, good for everything, not going to cover anaerobes. So we're going to rule that out. Um, imipenem, psilostatin, choice A, primaxin, um, great uh, for everything except MRSA. So it's missing the vanco. B is vanco alone, which wouldn't help us really for most of it. And then C would be vanco plus zosin, which is going to cover everything we want. So there's our uh, correct answer, choice C. Okay, antifungals. I'm going to go through these pretty quick. I'm not going to ask a ton of questions. There will be a few that pop up on the exam. I'm going to hopefully guide you towards uh, studying with this. But as far as antifungals go, um, there's a couple common ones we use, but for the most part, people who are on antifungals for more severe infections end up um, in pretty, they're usually in pretty rough shape. They're either immunocompromised or they have a really severe infection. And um, when you're looking at IV antifungal therapy for somebody who's in the ICU with a lung infection that's fungal based, um, you're looking at a really long course of treatment and pretty poor outcomes overall. So again, most of the general population not going to experience significant fungal infections. Um, immunocompromised patients, 
Um, people, they might use, we might use antifungals for people who are on broad spectrum antibiotics in a, you know, in an ICU and they just aren't getting better. They might empirically add it, even though they don't have any evidence to really support it. Um, and then again, some pathogens are quite difficult to treat and some fungal infections are really deadly regardless of how we treat it. Yeast, molds, mushrooms, um, unicellular, um, different types of cell wall than bacteria, so we use different drugs. Uh, these are kind of the basic fungi we're going to talk about and how we um, treat them. There's a couple different pathogen uh, specific diseases that I want to bring up when I talk about the different fungal, uh, antifungal drugs. I put the mechanisms on here for the different medications. So there's the azole classes of drugs. Um, you've got a couple other ones too, and these will make sense as we go through them a little bit more. If you want to review this slide, it's a good kind of summary of drug class and um, whether they work on the cell membrane or the cell wall. Amphotericin B, it's an old drug that's still quite useful. It's a really broad spectrum antifungal. It was historically quite toxic. Um, but in recent years, we've reformatted it with a um, as a liposomal formulation. And the, the only point of remembering that, if you want to remember it at all, is that liposomal formulation is uh, more renally tolerable. So amphotericin B used to be called amphoterable B because it destroyed people's kidneys. It's heavily renally toxic, and it still is a little bit, but with the new formulation, it's quite a bit better tolerated. Um, again, very effective, very broad spectrum drug as far as fungal coverage. It's going to cover pretty much all our different types of uh, fungi. Um, clinically, cryptococcal meningitis is something um, that we usually don't see really unless somebody is heavily immunocompromised, something associated with advanced HIV and other types of um, severe immunocompromised states. And then there's also, you could use it in a lot of different systemic fungal infections. However, it's not really all that common of a drug we're going to see. Again, toxicity, renal toxicity, uh, there's some other toxicity here. And the, the newer formulation, this liposomal formulation, is much better tolerated. Um, the azole antifungals represent probably the largest group and the most common ones you're going to see. Um, the one thing I'll have you want you to remember about azoles and they're pretty strong CYP enzyme inhibitors. So when you ever see somebody on an azole antifungal or you want to start an azole antifungal, you need to think about drug interactions because you're going to be inhibiting a pretty wide variety of common CYP enzymes, and they're pretty potent dead. It's not just minor inhibition. It's usually pretty major inhibition. Um, and a lot of the drugs are metabolized by the CYP system too, so you end up with um, issues if you're giving like a, an inducer of the CYP system. So if you induce 3A4 and your drug is metabolized by it, it's going to decrease the effect of it. Um, so just keep that in mind. These are really highly prone to drug interactions. Um, the spectrum of activity depends greatly on the agent. Some of these are narrow spectrum, some are quite um, quite broad spectrum, and uh, generally we don't use them in pregnancy. They don't have the best outcomes associated with them, although there are some topical drugs that actually are okay to use, like a topical product for like a vaginal candidiasis would be acceptable in pregnancy. Um, ketoconazole is a topical product. Uh, it's also available as a tablet, and again, topical candida infection is probably the only real use for ketoconazole. Um, the, the drug fluconazole or diflucan, the most commonly used for basic empiric candida infections. So when you're talking about the general population, this is really probably the only antifungal most people will ever encounter. Um, and it's most commonly used for women who have vaginal yeast infections. Um, it's a one-time oral dose. Uh, you could also use it for oral thrush. If people have thrush that involves the esophagus, they may be on an extended course of it. Works quite well for basic candida, which is candida albicans. There's some more advanced types of candida too, glabrata and crucii, which this drug will not work for. Um, and even, it also comes as an IV, so even um, more severe candida infections that are systemic can also be covered by fluconazole often too. So it is useful in acute situations depending on the sensitivity of the specific organism. Um, itraconazole is a uh, different um, azole drug that uh, it has some specific uh, uses down there. Um, it's a PL only one, so this is one that you might see people on for long-term use if they were maybe they had an aspergillus infection in their lungs. This could be something they take chronically, potentially not chronically as far as like for life, but for you know a couple months until the, the infection is cleared. Um, Voriconazole is a uh, popular choice for 
resistant candida infections. Um, so the drugs that basically fluconazole isn't going to cover. It's also one of our biggest um, first line agents for aspergillus. Um, aspergillus is a really nasty infection that if people get it usually don't do all that well. Um, it's something that again like most fungal infections affects immunocompromised people and it gets in the lungs. It's aspergillosis is the infection. Uh, pulmonary or invasive aspergillosis is often what it's called. Um, and uh, voriconazole is a drug we'll give oftentimes first for this, um, assuming we can try and get sensitivities and make sure it covers it. Um, uh, has some interesting side effects, does cause some abnormal vision changes. People can hallucinate and kind of see a halo effect on different uh, surfaces. So it's kind of weird with respect to that. Um, Posiconazole, uh, similar coverage. And uh, it's another one that's only oral. So really when we're talking about IV and PO, you're looking at Vori and, and uh, Fluconazole being the most um, popular here. The other ones are, are oral suspensions or oral products that um, are just going to be very um, uh, kind of have niche uses within clinical practice. Aren't going to see them used all that much. <clears throat> the kind of candens are a group of antifungals that are really broad spectrum. Um, they're extremely well tolerated and they're pretty expensive, but that doesn't prevent us from using them. Uh, they're the they end in fungin, all of them, and they all are basically lumped together. They really all have the same effect. So it's essentially we pick one based on how expensive they are. So we buy the cheapest one that our supplier of drugs can sell us, and we go with that one and we put that one on our hospital formulary. But really, they they can be interchanged uh, freely. Um, the resistance uh, for them is pretty low, and they are good for a more strong candida infection, so candida glabrata or cruciae. They work for invasive aspergillus, so pretty similar to voriconazole, broad spectrum activity. Um, and, but they have a lot less drug interactions than our azole. So while voriconazole is great for um, aspergillus, if you had somebody that you're really concerned about drug interactions, um, candidans really don't have as many. Uh, there's a couple um, things there. I don't want you to remember anything about TAC or cyclosporin or sirolimus or nifedipine, but um, these are um, anti-rejection medications for transplant patients. So if you had a transplant patient, of course, transplant patients would be immunocompromised, and so they're going to be at risk for fungal infections. might want to avoid a couple of these with them. These are only IV, so there's no oral option. Again, very well tolerated, maybe some headache and GI symptoms, but nothing more than that usually. Um, other agents, we have clotrimazole, uh, which is a uh, lotrimin. Lotrimin is um, probably the most common product used for uh, like ringworm or jock itch, which are tinea infections, our athlete's foot, and tinea pettis. Um, and then they're also available usually as vaginal creams and suppositories. They have basic coverage for candida species too, um, so they'll work for a, like a vaginal yeast infection. Terbenafine is very similar. It's uh, another topical used for the different tinea type infections. There's another new one that's kind of like terbenafine too that I saw over the counter. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, not super relevant. Um, it's just, uh, again, there's they're over the counter. They aren't systemic drugs. They're just used for um, uh, topical fungal infections. So if you're looking at your antifungal coverage, this is a good comparison to see what covers what, uh, where some of the problems are. And you can see like um, amphotericin B, some of the one of the more broad spectrum agents we have, um, not very really many holes in its coverage. And then like echinocandins do really great with candida, uh, don't really cover crypto. They do great with aspergillus, don't really cover some of these other ones. But um, again, the candida species and aspergillus are really our two biggest concerns when it comes to uh, infectious disease as far as clinical relevance and what we're going to see pretty frequently. Uh, don't spend too much time memorizing side effects. I think the big things to know are that um, azole antifungals have drug interactions associated with them, and um, voriconazole has some vision disturbances, and that econocandins are relatively well tolerated overall. Other than that, um, that, that's about all I would want you to know for this lecture. Oh, and amphotericin B cause kidney issues potentially is its biggest side effect. <clears throat> I'll touch briefly on malaria. Uh, malaria is one of the largest infectious illness on the planet. About 300 to 500 million new infections every year and about 1 to 2 million deaths. So we don't have this real problem in the U.S. because the mosquitoes that spread malaria don't generally get to um, areas of the U.S. and we just don't have this issue. 
um, based on the specific type of mosquito, but uh, it is possible to see, of course, patients traveling and coming back. And if you work in any type of clinic, um, you're probably going to prescribe anti-malarial therapy to traveling patients at some point in your career, I would assume, depending on where you work. But generally speaking, anyone who decides to go on some sort of tropical vacation um, is going to want to talk to you about what they need as far as malaria prophylaxis. <clears throat> Um, I just cut this out of the CDC data, and this is just showing that the CDC has a whole list of countries and regions of the world where they'll say what um, uh, risk is for traveling there for malaria for U.S. travelers and if there's drug resistance too. So this can help recommend specific therapy uh, in certain areas. So you can see several places have no known malaria, like Afghanistan. Excuse me, Afghanistan um, has a higher risk, and that gives you some recommendations specifically on some drugs to avoid. Uh, malaria, malaria is a mosquito borne illness, that's all I'm really going to say there. There's a nice diagram to show you what it does. Um, prevention is key. Um, regimens vary pretty substantially in cost, adverse effects, and the dosing schedules are all over the place. So I'm going to talk about some of these with respect to patient adherence, some of the more convenient ones. Um, there's a study done in 2009 that showed 90% of American travelers took an ineffective drug, took their drug inappropriately, or just didn't take the drug at all when they got prescribed malaria prophylaxis. So that's good to know that people are taking this seriously. Um, the usual strategy for prevention is that you take it prior to travel, you take it during your travel, and you take some period of time following um, your departure from your destination. Uh, Tovaquone proguanol or malarone, probably the most common drug. It's a really nice, simple regimen. You start it one to two days before. You take it during every day, once a day, and seven days following. Uh, it's pretty well tolerated, probably one of the better tolerated ones. It does have some GI effects. It's usually the biggest detriment to it from patient uh, adherence point of view. But um, if you take it with food, it can help a little bit. But um, otherwise, it's, it's a really common drug. Most people use malarone. It's kind of expensive, um, but it's, again, a pretty easy regimen to remember to take. Uh, Methylcline or larium is a once-weekly medication. So anytime I hear once-weekly, I get nervous because people don't remember to take things once a week. They just don't. I wouldn't if, if you gave me a once-weekly drug. Taking everything the same time every day, much easier to remember than once-weekly. Um, so with Methylquin, um, you start two to three weeks before and four weeks after. So not only is it once weekly, but you have a really long time interval that you have to think about taking this drug. So remember to continue it four weeks after you're done. Again, most people, it's not surprising if you prescribe this that they wouldn't take it correctly. Um, side effects are quite quite all over the place. The, the big problem with this drug, besides some of the GI, ups, GI issues and stuff, is the severe psychiatric side effects. So um, people can get really bad anxiety, depression, nightmares, um, paranoid ideation, more commonly seen in women. Um, usually, if somebody's going to go on a methylcan regimen, they're going to be starting it. Uh, you could consider starting them earlier, so start them like four weeks prior, just to make sure they're tolerating it and not getting paranoid prior to their trip. Uh, methylcan, however, is safe in pregnancy. However, I, I believe malarone is too. Oops, I lied. Um, malarone is not safe in pregnancy. Sorry about that. Um, Mefloquin is, so that would be maybe an option for a pregnant patient traveling. Although a woman getting psychiatric effects um, would also be something, of course, you'd want to consider. Um, doxycycline, uh, we talked about already as one of our antibiotic options. It's effective against malaria. It's not a commonly used one, but um, it is uh, a pretty straightforward regimen, although you do have to take it four weeks following, um, so that just is going to hurt compliance significantly. Tolerability is pretty good. However, it does cause sun sensitivity, and most people who are in malaria exposed or in malaria risk zones are usually closer to the equator and therefore probably exposed to maybe more sun than they're used to. And it can cause um, increases of sunburn. So that's uh, something we probably want to avoid in a lot of people. It's also contraindicated in pregnant patients and children less than eight. We talked about the, the teeth gray staining. Chloroquine is a drug that's once weekly, start one week before, four weeks after again, once weekly plus a long regimen equals poor compliance. Um, it's a pretty well tolerated drug though. There's um, it's an older drug. It's not uh, it's not as um, 
it's, it's not as robust as some of the newer ones like Malaron, so you might see more resistance to it worldwide. But if it is an option, it's probably going to be a common one that's used because it's cheap and um, it's pretty well tolerated. Um, it is also safe in pregnancy. And then there's Primaquin, which is a regimen that is one to two days before, seven days following. Um, you could get this rare effect called hemolytic anemia, which is unusual, otherwise GI upset, and is also contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, active infections of malaria are unusual. <laughs> there are a couple of drugs out there um, called artemisinin, and uh, the, there are two specific ones. One's called coartem, which is artemether lumenfetrine, and the other is artesunate. Uh, these are tricky drugs. They're, um, they're actually IVN. There is PO cord. I'm available. I actually just said something. In, somebody in their hospital on cord. Um, so, uh, but to get the drug, you usually have to go through different channels to get it. So you have to contact the CDC or your local Department of Health specifically to be able to obtain them. There are things you can just buy off the shelf or order from your distributor. Um, it's just not a usual thing we see in the United States. So if we have an active case of malaria, it's something that wants to be tracked and we want to make sure we're treating it appropriately. So getting infectious disease involved in all those things. Um, don't worry about active infections for the exam. I won't ask any questions about those because they're, they're going to be quite rare in the United States. Okay. Let's see. Uh, parasitic infections. I'm just going to go through this really quickly and finish up here. Um, Giardia is a diarrhea-related parasite. It's common worldwide through um, contaminated food or water sources, so it's a fecal-oral transmission. You get pretty intense diarrhea, cramps, bloating, flatulence um, with copious diarrhea. Uh, metronidazole does treat it quite well. Um, that's all I want to say about Giardia. Um, Helminth infections, you have worms that uh, cause different types of problems in the body. Um, they're multicellular organisms and they tend to be intestinal for the most part, but they can also migrate to other areas in the body. Uh, roundworms um, can be anything from roundworm, whipworm, hookworm, or pinworm. Um, all these worms are treated with the same drugs. They're treated with mebendazole. These are going to destroy the larvae. What they do is they degenerate cytoplasmic microtubules. Uh, they're usually in pretty short courses and they're mostly well tolerated. Um, Ivermectin is another option too. It's an oral drug. Um, it can be given for this. It's also a topical drug that's used for lice. Um, can cause itching, maybe fever in some patients. Flukes are um, a little bit different of a, of a bug altogether. Um, schistosoma is probably the, the common one that you might see around here. It's associated with swimmer's itch. Uh, so snails pass it around. So beaches with snails on them are always ones that you should watch out for potentially, um, which is like every beach in Minnesota. So probably not a big deal, but <laughs> occasionally people do get this. Um, the treatment is a drug called Prazaquantil um, with some adverse effects, generally well tolerated. And again, pretty short courses. You don't see this used a whole lot, um, but occasionally this does crop up and there are drugs available for it. Um, tapeworms are seen in a lot of different types of undercooked meat. So there's a couple of different types for beef and a different type for pork. Um, a lot of these infections aren't going to be clinical um, for the most part, but if they spread to muscles, they can um, kind of build up in the muscle mass. And um, you can end up possibly with even neurologic involvement, which would be highly problematic, of course. Um, albendazole and prazacontol are both drugs that can be used for this. And that's, uh, that's it. So um, with respect to this lecture, uh, again, I pointed out the antifungals that I think are most important and some of the things to know about them. With respect to malaria, the prophylactic regimens have a good idea for which ones can be used when. And uh, don't remember any of the, the courses or anything like that. But um, you know the more common ones, maybe some of the side effects I pointed out. Um, as far as um, these parasitic drugs, um, really there's three of them, um, mebendazole, albendazole, and prazaquantol. So there's only a couple to remember, and I don't really want you to know anything more about them other than they can be used to treat helminth infections. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to be done for tonight.
what um, I did post the cases and I will go over the cases uh, in a video and we'll post a key to the cases uh, towards the end of the week. Um, so with that in mind, uh, keep up the good work studying. Um, my general advice is that you really just need to to kind of hunker down and put in the the work for the knowing the drugs there's a lot of new drugs and I get that uh, and everything kind of has its own language and pharmacy is definitely not uh, definitely part of you know the general medical um, terminology and it has its own subset of terminology to know and I know it's a lot um, but antibiotics are really important so um, this is uh, a lot of information in a small amount of time it's a longer test that I'm gonna give you guys next Monday ultimately um, the course does stabilize, stabilize a little bit so don't think like this is how I always work I know it's been a little bit disjointed but I was really happy that George got to come in and, and do his lecture because I thought we we're gonna have to cancel that all together so um, with that being said as you're studying, um, you can look forward to um, antibiotics being probably a pretty large chunk of the test. I would say probably about 50%. Um, there will be some questions on those intro lectures too, so don't forget about them. There are um, they'll be pretty basic. I think if you go through the lectures, you'll pick them out. Like differences between FDA clinical trials, some of the basic stuff about hepatic enzyme inhibition and induction. Um, basic stuff about kidney element like renally eliminated drugs how we dose for that and what kind of equations we use not memorizing the equations but knowing generally that there are equations to do that uh, those are some of the questions you can expect they'll be pretty basic from the, those lectures the complicated questions are of course going to be infectious disease related um, I think George pointed out a fair amount of stuff from his lectures that are important and I'll be asking a smattering of HIV related questions uh, and then, again, as you're studying, like I said in class, anything that comes up or anything you want to clarify, please email me. Um, if you are studying in a group and want to email on behalf of the group, great. If you want to post on the news forum and ask a question, that's fine too. People usually don't do that, but it is an option. Uh, but anyway, I'm here. I'll be paying attention. And again, um, look for the case review coming up shortly.